Almost 70 years ago, these men were boys just out of school. In one fell swoop, you ceased being a boy and you became a man. So young to be caught up in the world's darkest hour, the last year of the Second World War. Now in old age, these precious few survivors are all around us, hidden in plain view. This is the last chance to hear what really happened firsthand. German bodies, Canadian bodies, British bodies. The smell, the stench. That's war. That's war. From the landings on the D-Day beaches, to fighting in the Battle of the Bulge in a freezing winter, and storming through Europe uncovering the true horrors of Nazi Germany. How can human people do that to other human people? How can they do it? It's their story in their words, not the one written by generals and historians. After all these years, still no metal. Where there's original film, we'll see where they fought. Where archive doesn't exist, We'll use real bombs and weapons to illustrate what our veterans went through. This is the story of the final year of World War II in Europe, as told by the last war heroes. American soldiers were in a race against the Germans. I think there were about 70 different German bridges across the Rhine River. And the Germans blew up those bridges so that we couldn't go across. One bridge was left standing. The Americans got there too late. Germans set off explosive charges, but failed to destroy it. The Allies knew they had to get across the Rhine before the enemy made another attempt to blow up the bridge. The war in Europe was reaching its final phase, but it was taking a heavy toll on the soldiers. So far, they'd battled on the Normandy beaches, fought in the streets of Caen, endured relentless combat in the coldest winter for decades. Then pushed back a German counter-attack and broken through the Siegfried line. The generals now plan to launch a massive attack over the Rhine, the last obstacle between the Allies and Nazi Germany then race against Stalin's Red Army towards Hitler's heavily defended fortress, Berlin. I received orders to cross the bridge as rapidly as possible. As we drove across it, there were holes in the bridge and we dodged around them. And also, I looked up on the right and I saw on the truss, there was a big break in the truss that the Germans had exploded. And I could tell that if that truss were to go all the way, the bridge would collapse. The engineers were at the far end, you know. Hey, you dumb Yanks, you better double time it. The bridge is going up any minute, you know. So we double timed the whole bridge. As the Allies raced across in great numbers, the Germans became even more desperate to destroy it. The Germans attacked it with over 200 aircraft, dropping bombs and so forth, trying to get that bridge to go down. I never saw so many any aircraft guns. 
They were trying to save the bridge from being bombed. And the German aircraft that were coming in, they were just firing away all the time. They really put up a lot of firepower. Despite heavy bombing, Frank, Bill, and over 25,000 Allied troops crossed the Ludendorff Bridge. Badly damaged, 10 days later, it finally fell into the Rhine. When the bridge finally collapsed, they had a whole bunch of ambulances on board on, on the bridge that had wounded on it, and they all died. It was loaded with ambulances and other vehicles, but mainly ambulances. With the last remaining bridge in ruins, the generals had to find another way to get troops across the Rhine. They launched a massive airborne attack. Twenty-one-year-old Patrick Delaforce and his unit provided covering fire for the airborne troops. Our job was to pass the remains of the German armies that had been thrown over the river. We fired our guns non-stop for about 10 hours. And that was the biggest consecutive bombardment that I'd ever been in, anybody else had been in. And on the far side, we can see the, the airborne division going over. Among them was platoon sergeant Andy Anderson from Toronto, Canada. He clearly remembers the moment just before he jumped. I'm looking at the Rhine River and I'm thinking, Jesus, that's an awful wide river. It's only seconds later that the green light comes on and it's go. I could hear the crack of rifle fire and machine gun fire and I could look up to see that the canopy was open and sure enough, there's a couple of holes through the canopy. Also jumping that day, 21-year-old Jan de Vries. When I heard the bullets going by, I looked up, saw the whole shoot full of holes. Jesus, get me down. The breeze caught me, and I came through the trees, broke a few branches on the way down, and came to a jolt about seven feet off the ground. That was it. And I hung there. And the Germans were sweeping the field with a machine gun, and I had to cut myself free so I could fall clear. And I couldn't get my knife because of the equipment. I could see the branches drop on each side of me, but they always missed. And then two guys came along, and one of them lifted the other one up. And then the weight of the three of us pulled my canopy clear and came down. And I was, with well, the three of us were on the ground. So I was a happy boy again. As more airborne troops landed, the remaining ground forces were making the crossing all along the Rhine. Nineteen-year-old Arnold Whitaker was one of the troops about to navigate the river by boat. We didn't have in basic training. We didn't take a coordinated rowing lessons. So the engineers would pound on the side to get us coordinated. To make things worse, they were coming under heavy German shelling. It wasn't until one of those shells hit the bottom of the river that we finally got with it and say, let's get across. 
the water itself would not ignite the shell. It hit the bottom of the river and then, and then and exploded and would come up like Old Faithful, like this. If that was below your flat bottom rowboat, it'd flip you over with uh, uh, 70 pounds of gear. So you weren't killed by the artillery, you just drowned. With Arnold was his good friend Goldie. They'd been in combat together since September 1944. We had uh, an unspoken word. Don't get too close to some of your, vo your foxhole buddies because you don't know how long you're going to have them. And I got cl close to Goldie. He was from Sulphur Spring, Texas. He was six foot two, blonde, blue eyes, destined to be a movie star. He was downright handsome. And we crossed the Rhine, and there was a sniper picking us off. One thing about a sniper, if you hear the bullet, you're, you're alive. In other words, if you don't hear it, you're dead. And I, I, he missed me right beside my ear. Right then. And then my friend Dick Weiss, he came over and, they, and they, they got him in the left arm. And I said, where's Goldie? And the next guy got over and the sniper didn't hit him. He said, Goldie isn't coming. He says he got it right here in the, in the throat. I started crying. I thought, what a shame that why he's come all this way and well I did 19 year old dirty old infantry replacement walking and firing his M1 and crying I wasn't doing a very good job of firing my M1 I was just doing it mechanically and and I, I shouldn't have got so emotionally tied but By the end of March 1945, thousands more troops had crossed the Rhine and pushed on into Germany. After five years of woe, despondency, that was a colossal leap forward. Psychologically, it was very important. The die is really cast. We're now we're getting into the heartland of, of the Third Reich. As the Allies on the ground headed towards Berlin, the Air Force was sent in to bomb key cities and weaken German defences. 24-year-old Leonard Levy was a Lancaster bomber pilot. He remembers the anxiety and fear before each mission. The briefing starts in a very large room. And the wing commander is pointed to Berlin and in one voice, 150 voices would say, oh, shit. Berlin was the most heavily defended city in all of Europe. Most heavily defended city in all of Europe. used to like to stand and pee on the wheels of the aircraft before they would take off for luck. Some of the guys would say, Leonard, are you wearing your lucky sweater? Everybody had a little thing. Everybody had a little thing.
going to take you on our last trip to Berlin. Okay? This is going to be six, seven hundred aircraft in the air at the same time. Night fighters, flak, searchlights. They had 88 guns that were unbelievable. If you ever been in a car and you have been in a hailstorm and what it sounds like on your car, that's what flak sounds like on the body of a, an aircraft. All you hear is bing, 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 bing. The aircraft went down. No parachutes came out. Seven young men in that aircraft. They're gone. That aircraft's, that aircraft's gonna go straight down, and those guys didn't get out. That's what happens. Lancasters dropped both high explosive and incendiary bombs. Some were modified to carry just one big bomb. The tall boys were blockbusters. And when I say blockbusters, that's what they wear. They were anywhere up to 20,000 pounds. 20,000 pounds, 10 ton, one bomb. As soon as the bomb's away, your aircraft is like this, and all of a sudden it goes like this. Because it's lost all of that weight and it just lifts itself automatically. On their way home, Leonard and his crew ran into trouble, all the details faithfully recorded in his flight log. We've now been flying like over 10 hours. The port outer engine was damaged and ceased to function. The aircraft filled with smoke and fire. We lost our hydraulics, we lost our electronics, and the night fighter on our tail was eventually shaken, although 8,000 feet of altitude was lost. A course was set across the North Sea for the nearest coast of England. We ended up crash landing at a fighter drone called Coldashaw. We had a total of about 55,000 aircrew. 16,000 were dead. 16,000 never came home. The Allies were getting close to Berlin from the west. Two and a half million Russian soldiers were coming in from the east. The race for victory was on. We went through Germany so quick, I, I really don't remember hardly anything. We were just moving, moving, moving. And we started advancing about eight to 10 miles a day, capturing hundreds of, of Germans every day. In fact, there were so many of them that our soldiers would just wave them on the roads and have them go back without guards sometimes.
But every once in a while, we'd come to a village where they wouldn't surrender, and they kept firing. And then out come these guys with a white flag, and we saw they were all young kids, Hitler Yugen. But the Hitler Yugen were fanatics. And they had their hands on their head saying, comrade, comrade, comrade. And then suddenly it dawned on us, when we took their weapons, they had no ammunition. They had fired every round they had, and this went on for a couple of days, a couple of villages. And finally, the battalion commander, Colonel Horner, come up and said, this is crazy, waste them. And I had never heard that word before, waste them. So if they didn't surrender, they come out the next morning, we killed every one of them. And it didn't phase us in the least. The Allies raced towards Berlin and expected to reach it within days. Unknown to some, the generals decided the honor of taking Germany's capital city would be given to the Russians. One of the Red Army soldiers who had that honor was 24-year-old Yakov Yakin. Born in the Ukraine to a Jewish family, he'd been fighting the Germans for over four years. In 1945, early spring, and by then we had the feeling we were equal to the Germans. We weren't afraid of them anymore. We had a long period of advancing behind us. Morale was quite high. Berlin was all ruins because of the massive American and British bombardment. The people were in the basements. There was no water, no electricity, there was no food. It was just ruins. We met our first serious resistance in the suburbs of Berlin. That was when the hard fighting really started, and it was hand-to-hand -hand fighting, and the casualties were serious. First, the tanks went in, but because the Germans had Panzerfaust, which could penetrate the tank and explode from inside, our tanks were easy targets, and many were destroyed. The Germans used explosive bullets, which seemed to be everywhere. We felt surrounded, and so everybody panicked. So we changed strategy. The infantry went in first under the support of mortars. We tried to surround the building and get the Germans to surrender. We'd throw grenades inside. And if that didn't work, despite the danger, we'd go in and advance step by step, till there was hand-to-hand -hand fighting with them. There wasn't anything heroic about it. It was just a hard job. There were sometimes civilians in the buildings, and when the buildings collapsed because of the explosions of grenades and shells, people were killed under the rubble. While the Russians fought their way through the bombed-out streets of Berlin, Allied units went after the rest of the German army. 400 miles west of Berlin, Patrick Delaforce was advancing through the quiet German countryside. Suddenly, we were halted and the medical people came round and rather rudely squirted white DDT down all our uniforms, down our trousers, 
shirt, head. And we said, what the hell is going on? They said, well, it's a typhus area up in front. There were a total of 60,000 there. What we could smell and see were rags all over the place. Rags. They weren't rags. They were dead bodies, or dying bodies. And the smell was appalling. And if you concentrated on anything, you'd see that tree there at the bottom of it or something. Occasionally, there'd be a little twitch. That person might not actually be dead. Everywhere, the whole landscape was with these little bags of rags, really. That's all they looked like at that stage. And of the 60,000, uh, in the next four weeks, 16,000 died. There's nothing anybody could do for them. We didn't know anything about concentration camps. Never heard of them. Nobody had ever heard of them. Bergen-Belsen was just one of many camps being discovered all across Europe. One hundred and twenty miles south, American units were heading towards the town of Nordhausen. Amongst them, 21-year-old Morton Waitzman, the youngest of seven from a Jewish family. We came under fire from German machine gunners at the sentry gates, and we were seasoned infantry. We knew how to handle that. Uh, they were disposed of in a hurry. And we blew down the gates of Dora Middlebau, uh, and greeted by these thousands of dead bodies. In the camp, Morton's regiment discovered an underground factory where men and women worked as slaves, making Hitler's V2 rockets. The stench was unbelievable. They did bodies in a form that were indescribable. We finally got to a place where there were crematoria and there were about 10 or so ovens in that crematorium. We were told to open up the doors of, of each one. Uh, they were warm or hot, and we found the bones and ashes that you would expect. We got to uh, the middle one, the walls were cold, and our commanding officer, uh, uh, Lieutenant Ungerleiter, also a Jew, said, be careful about this. And there was a group of us who opened up the doors, and this was going to be different from the other ovens. And there was a German officer inside that oven with a Luger pistol in his hand, and he was going to kill as many Americans as he could. He knew the Americans were coming. He never did fire a shot because we had our M1 rifles aimed in that oven. Eight of us emptied our rifles, eight shots each, and he never knew what hit him. He never fired a shot. Several survivors came to us afterwards, have no pity for him. He was responsible for much of what you saw here at Dora Middlebaugh.
Allied generals gave orders about the treatment of guards. They were to be taken prisoner and protected, unless they presented a threat. I heard pop, 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 pop. I thought, well, who the hell was firing? We weren't allowed to fire, you see. But my colonel, Bob Daniel, was a Jew. He went out from his tank and he'd shot five of the guards. Bang, bang, bang. He got back on his tank, he said to the brigadier, well, it's, it's a small effort, but I've done something. After liberating the camp at Dora Mittelbau, Morton Waitsman's unit moved on to a small town called Gardelagen. Here they found SS guards had abandoned a group of prisoners after coming under Allied fire. They rounded up those too weak to walk, locked them in a barn, and set fire to it. As we came by, The arms were stretched through those bars, begging for help. There was nothing we could do. We couldn't fire into the, into the, into the barn. Uh, we couldn't open up the gates. The fire was intense. And the Germans succeeded in burning alive thousands of people at Gardelligan. 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 It's not easy. It's, it's damn hard to talk about it. Uh, these were human beings. The story doesn't go away. The emotions and the horror of it doesn't go away. In Berlin, the Russians advanced towards the center and turned on the few German units left in the city. They pounded the buildings with everything they could, including their devastating Katusha rockets. Yakov Krenin was one of the men who operated them. He was just 14 when he went to the Moscow Artillery School. The Germans were terrified of it. It was also a psychological weapon. They were terrified of the Katusha rockets. We participated in the annihilation of a group southeast of Berlin. We told them to surrender. They refused, so we surrounded them by Katusha. At first, there was a hiss, and it was getting stronger. More rockets joined in, and the noise was deafening. Long, growling arrows flew, their tails flaming. After they were fired, everything in the area was destroyed. The signal to make our tanks move forward was the red flag. Resistance wasn't as hard as before. 
in our region was just half a kilometer from the bunker where Hitler was hiding. On May the 2nd, we didn't recognize this city. It became completely snowy white, because there were white flags, towels and sheets everywhere. One German lady came up to me, I don't know why me particularly, and she said, Officer, my husband is Jewish and I was hiding him for five years. Can he come out of the basement now? I told her to tell her husband I am Jewish as well. Tell him to come out. It was a great anticlimax. You came from, it was like a drug. You were on a high of fairly controlled excitement. And my God, it was exciting. And then suddenly it stopped. They'd all, Germans all quit. And all you saw around you was wounded Germans, defeated Germans, sad Germans. I've never been on drugs, but, but, but I can imagine how awful it is to come off your drug, but that's what war is a drug. All over the world, Millions of people took to the streets to take part in victory celebrations. These young men who'd gone to war as ordinary boys and survived, returned home as heroes. When I returned home, I knocked on the door, because my mother didn't know exactly when I was coming, and she opened the door and saw me and said Arnold in a way that I never remember her ever using it again in her entire life. It was, it was, uh, it, it was filled with uh, pent up uh, relief and, and love and everything like that. It was, uh, never, never, and she lived in 90, did I ever remember my mother using my name with that particular tone. It was so unique that I remembered it all my life. There must have been five or six hundred people waiting for me. And my mother was there and my dad was there and all the big wigs were there. All these people were cheering and hollering and clapping, and I really felt special.
and they were having a big party that night, but I wanted to go home. So I phoned my dad to tell him I'd be on the midnight train. And when I, he answered the phone, uh, he says, that you, Doug? I said, yeah. He said, just a minute, I'll get your mother. I was so mad. I thought, God, I've been away three years. I come back and, you know, talk to me. But I found out later on from mother, he couldn't talk to me, he's crying. When I got home, and I never talked about the war, about the camps that we saw, I never talked about any of the experiences I had from D-Day on. It was something which brought on the nightmares and the difficulties that I had for so many years afterwards. For 50 years, I didn't talk about it. the death of people, the screams, uh, overwhelming sound of, of uh, explosions. Even things like the smells, the smell of fir trees mixed with the smell of death, the flames of uh, a burning tank with bodies in it. And it forced me to think what life was all about. This is where you lose all oh, humanity. Is it just makes you live like an animal. But still, you have the urge, the sense of not letting your friends down, and there's the sons of bitches, and you're going to go get them. You've still got that fire in your belly. And you're cold and hungry and wet, but you still go and go and go. I suppose we all have an inbuilt ability to consciously forget the bad things. There are sufficient bad moments to cause us in later life uh, to remember with sadness uh, things that happened. And those things we, we try to forget. Yeah. After all these years, still no metal. I felt that God saved me through that uh, ordeal on the beach. I should have been dead. To live through something like that shows you that life is important and each day, like I tell my wife, every day maybe uh, five times a day that how much I love her and my kids. All my kids say, when they talk to me, they say, I, I love you and we say the same thing back. Because you never know when your time is gonna be up. What an adventure it was, but very emotional, 
very hard. You lived for today. Tomorrow, you did not know. Then I think how lucky I went through it all and lived to talk about it.